right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Today we have Carl Friston with us. So welcome to the show, man. It's great to be here. You too. Um, so yeah, tell me a little bit more um, to kick us off. Tell us a little bit more about you and what you do. I'm a professor of neuroscience at University College London. Um, my day job is essentially to make sense of brain imaging data or human brain mapping data to understand um, the functional anatomy of the brain. And at the weekends, I do theoretical biology and specifically theoretical neurobiology, um, things like the free energy principle and active infants. Okay. You know, it's so crazy right now. So I have to ask, I had different questions in mind, but I just had a flash is my uncle, he came over a few years ago and he, he did this to me and my brother. And I don't know if it's the exact thing that we're talking about today, but he basically, he had like these caps and it had like kind of little needly kind of things all over it. And then he, he like put some, I don't, it wasn't oil but it was something that he like put on it, like kind of like this on all of them. And then he put it on our head and then we had to like focus, relax. And then he, it was like our brain waves or something. And then he was able to tell us a a lot about how our brain works based on that fluctuation. Is that what, is that the same thing? That's exactly, well, it's one of, uh, and probably one of the more interesting ways of peering inside your skull to see how your brain works. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that sounds like, electroencephalography or EEG and it was gel um yes in- gel it was gel yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yo that and i remember too because it was so funny like it took it for some reason with that gel and the way that it like screws or something it's not a screw but the way that that works you have to get it like perfectly kind of right uh, on all of them so to get it set up it took a while because it was like out of range or whatever yeah uh, so that was interesting it took like I don't know, 30 minutes to 45 minutes just to get it like set properly. Um, I don't know if that's that's normal or not, but that's how it (laughs) happened. That's that's very old school. Uh, Nowadays, people would would use something called MEG. So instead of electrical uh, sensors that require a good conductivity between the electrode and the skin, you use magnetic fields. So you don't actually have to uh, faff around with the gel. So you just put your head in a helmet or sometimes optically pumped magnetometers um, that don't require the gel. So, so more, more modern versions of that kind of technology are much more convenient. But I, I remember when I was younger, I had to do that with um, for research. You know, spent hours getting, getting the connectivity with the gel right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Not- connectivity. That's what, okay. I can't, I can't wait to tell him. I'm going to obviously send him this interview, right? We're not, for some reason I did not do that comparison before. And then as soon as you like started talking, I, I just saw his face in my head. Um, so how did you, like, what were you doing before you got into this space? Like when you were younger, I'm assuming you didn't uh, predict that you would be doing anything like this. So w- what, what were you thinking you were going to be doing? And then how did you fall or get into this space? Um, well, interestingly, uh, I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do when I was about 14 or 15. So, so <laughs> wow, okay, it, it, it's taken a long time to actually uh, create the time and the space to focus on what I wanted to do when I was um, a schoolboy, which is um, mathematical psychology or the maths, the calculus, the mechanics of how the brain works. Um, so, I studied physics and then became a doctor. Um, and the, then a psychiatrist, and then got into research at the age of 28. Um, and that research over the past 10 years has subsumed my day job and my uh, more theoretical um, um, aspirations. Wow. So 14, 15. Okay, now wait a second. So the, the better question then would be before 14, 15, how did you come across, like, how did you know, because that's a young age to like be so clear on what you want to do. So what happened to you in your life or what book did you read to know at that age that this is what you wanted to do? Um, the books I read, that's a really great question. The books I read were the books that my parents um, 
uh, would either leave around or make me read. And one of my uh, parents, my mother, was uh, a nurse, but fascinated by psychology. So she used to make me read all sorts of popular and academic psychology books. My father was a bridge engineer um, and had a fascination with mechanics and relativity and all things scientific and um, mathematical. So he he would make me read things like Sir Arthur Eddington's Space, Time and Gravitation. So I think the mixture of the two, um, mm. you know, sort of <laughs> having been exposed to these <laughs> two perspectives on how the world work uh, worked, um, uh, ended up with me wanting to apply the the uh, the spirit of engineering and mathematics um, to the problem of psychology and, and how we work or how our brains work at least. Got it. No, that makes sense. Um, so then I'm curious because I was reading something too. Uh, it was something like associated with schizophrenia. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm just saying that to trigger something else is that what are with this, with what you've done with like brain mapping and stuff, what are some of the kind of biggest discoveries, I guess, is the question. Like what, when you were doing research at 28 and doing all these things, like what were you trying to figure out, I guess? And then based on the answer to that, what were some of the biggest things that you did figure out from it? Yeah, well, you know, that, that's a, a big question. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but to just to take you back to say the late um, 1980s, uh, early 1990s, it was at this point that I entered research um, and uh, um, having just qualified as a psychiatrist with a special interest in and uh, responsibility for people with schizophrenia. But the, uh, the, the, you know, in re uh, response to your question, at that point, all that we knew about the, uh, the anatomy, the functional anatomy, the organization of the brain was what we knew from either animal studies or what's called neuropsychology, which is essentially what you lose in terms of your functionality and capability if you damage part of your brain through a stroke or through some invasive um, um, injury. So for the first time with brain mapping in, that arrived at that point in time, we were able to measure the responses of the brain during certain uh, perceptual acts like looking at color versus not color, um, through um, being in different brain states or attending to this or attending to that or to moving and not moving, for example. So for the first time, we were able to test the uh, hypotheses based upon um, animal work, um, uh, electrophysiology and uh, neuropsychology and uh, demonstrate two key principles of brain organization. So the first one was functional specialization, the idea the little parts of your brain are specialized to particular things. For example, this part of the brain might be responsible for doing for seeing color or processing color. Uh, this part of the brain might be involved in generating, um, say, um, words in a verbal fluency test. This part of the brain may be involved in the, um, the analysis or processing of visual motion. So everything that we do, everything that we... Um, have to possess to be sentient creatures and to um, enact sentient behavior relies upon all this functionality. So the question was, was this functionality localized to particular parts of the brain or was it distributed everywhere? Um, so in fact, we were able to show, or when I say we, the entire community over that decade was able to show that this um, hypothesis, this principle of functional specialization and segregation of that um, functionality to particular pro, uh, pro, um, brain areas was actually true. You know, we could show for the first time that when people um, saw color pictures, this part of the brain lit up, activated, got excited, started processing, but not a, a, any other part of the brain. That was a key thing. You could only say that when you had the whole brain imaged at once. That became um, known fondly uh, or perhaps not as uh, blobology. So you may remember, you know, seeing on the news activation blobs, hotspots, heat maps <laughs> of, uh, of the brain in action. Um, 
and, and less kindly sort of neo-cartography, this, um, um, you know, the, you know the, the notion that, you know, you can pal palpate the skull um, and, you know, discern somebody's capabilities with, you know, feeling little, uh, little lumps and um, um, uh, exuberances. Um, and then the next big thing was, um, okay, so we've identified the brain is this compendium, this um, this uh, architecture of specialized regions, but how do the different regions talk to each other? And this was the question of functional integration. So it's functional specialization or differentiation of function and then integration, the connectivity, you know, nowadays known as the connectome. So most of the discoveries and the work um, over the ensuing or the subsequent decade were about understanding the principles of connectivity and the architectures that were underwritten by that connectivity. And one important one, of course, is, is the notion of um, how the surface of the brain speaks to deep structures in the brain, um, how different um, surface or cortical brain structures are organized hierarchically. And that notion of a hierarchical architecture um, uh, has subsequently proved absolutely central for understanding the message passing in the brain and the way that you make sense of your sensory data and um, select the plans and the actions that would you know that you will then commit to that, that um, determine how you actually behave, talk, think, cogitate. Gotcha. No, and I, I remember that now I'll probably keep referencing it just because it, it was how we started off. But now with my uncle, that's how it was. Is basically he would ask uh, questions, and then based on some things I would say, I guess he was looking at where what parts in my brain were lighting up, or some. And I'm sure there's way more to it, but that was like part of it. Um, so, were you? Is it safe to say? I just want to make sure I'm saying this right. That like you were you the first to like discover this, or how does this how does this work, or like what's the origin? Uh, you were doing research, and then you and a team are. Uh, yeah, see, you were definitely at the forefront, or are you literally the person that discovered it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I was a young person at the forefront of a tide of discovery. Um, okay. so, so my particular contribution was the, um, the mathematics um, that enable you to create x-rays of functionality. So to analyze, so for, I imagine that your uncle um, was looking at occipital alpha, which is occipital means the back of the brain. Alpha is a particular um, rhythm of brain activity, about 10 hertz, so 10 fluctuations every, every um, 10 times a second. And that can be modulated depending upon whether you are attentive, whether your eyes are open or closed. So just by looking at the idling rhythms of the brain, you can tell a lot about different brain states and what you're actually doing. Hmm. To actually make those assertions, though, there's a lot of um, statistical mathematics and probability theory, which goes into taking these data from outside the head and then uh, effectively reconstructing the dynamics and the activity that goes on inside the head. Uh, and that mathematics is, is, is what I, I, I was responsible for. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, very, very important part of it. I would say my dad, I know it's different. My dad's an accountant, so he loves numbers. I, I, I'm not a numbers guy, so I cannot relate to this, but I like it. <laughs> we need people like you, that's for sure. Um, so going back to the schizophrenia thing, like what, um, so let's just actually, let's run through this scenario. Let's say somebody had schizophrenia and they're struggling to obviously cope with it or deal with it is this like the mapping could discovering where the issue is help that patient to potentially i don't know if schizophrenia is a curable or if it's like a pill that deters it or something but it do you see the question i'm kind of like yeah no absolutely um well, there are a number of really important questions there. Um, so, um, first of all, you know, I mean, schizophrenia, um, it, you know, it's a, it, it can be a devastating illness, but it, um, certain symptoms and signs of schizophrenia do respond to different kinds of therapy. And it also has a natural time course. So, um, 
you know, typically it would come on in late adolescence um, and look different at different stages in your life. And, and usually it's less florid as you get older. So, you know, it, it's not all bad news, but it, it can be a devastating illness. Um, <clears throat> in response to your question about, you know, how would you use an understanding of functional brain architectures or brain imaging or neuroimaging to get at the the pathophysiology, the uh, the uh, aberrant physiology, the, the the message passing, the you know the uh, the processing in the brain that might undergird some of the symptoms and signs of schizophrenia. Um, the, the answer to that comes in two flavors. So it could have been that there was a particular part of the brain that was broken. Um, and certainly people very early on um, were looking at abnormal frontal lobe activations and responses to particular tasks in people with schizophrenia. Um, however, um, within a few years um, and with reference and deference to some very early ideas about the nature of schizophrenia, and I'm thinking here about sort of 19th century great thinkers like Wernicke and Bloiler, um, both of whom emphasized um, a disconnection. So remember before we have the functional specialization and the functional integration, and it may well be that schizophrenia is a failure of the integration, a failure for one part of the brain to talk to another part of, of the brain. So Wernicke had something called the surjunction hypothesis, which was the notion that you could explain um, in those days what was called dementia praecox, uh, in terms of an abnormality of communication between the wires that connect different parts of the brain, uh, what's called the, the axons. Um, whereas Bloiler was, was sort of more functional and, and emphasized a disintegration of the psyche, of a disintegration of mental life. So it'd be very difficult if you had schizophrenia to think in a coherent and linear way. Um, the kind of disconnection that we're talking about um, also can lead to um, delusions and hallucinations, you know, believing things are true when they are not, uh, seeing things that are there when they're not actually there. And I sort of highlight those florid psychotic uh, symptoms because they speak to um, an important conception or understanding of how the brain works, which is uh, the notion of the brain as a an inference machine, as, a, as an organ that is trying to make sense of data by making inferences, by, by testing hypotheses, you know, is that a cat or is it a bird or is there somebody behind me or not? So using the sensory information that we sample with our eyes and with our ears and, you know, everything, all our senses, including our interception, um, using that information to find the best explanation for what's going on out there beyond our sensory organs, beyond our sensory epithelia. So if that's our job, which is to make sense of our world, then schizophrenia um, could be understood as a failure of that kind of inference. So if you're a statistician, how could you make a bad inference? Well, you could infer that there was an effect of this treatment or um, an effect of this group difference when it wasn't there. And that would be a type one error. And that's exactly like somebody seeing something that is not there or believing that somebody else has a particular intentional stance towards them, which they don't have, or that the person on the television is talking to them personally, as opposed to, you know, just broadcasting the news. So these, you know, the, this, um, these particular florid psychotic symptoms fit very comfortably with a failure of the message passing and the functional integration, the right kind of connectivity that enables brains to make sense of the sensorium, of the, all the visual and the auditory and the tactile and interceptive information it has at hand. So that 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 direction of travel, um, I mean, obviously there are many people and many perspectives you know, that, that, that underwrite that, um, that notion of the brain as a, a failure of integration or a disconnection-like uh, syndrome, but certainly a lot of momentum to the idea 
was um, derived from the early days of brain imaging in people with schizophrenia. Got it. That's so interesting. So how much, um, uh, I'm trying to think which one I want to ask first. Let's go to this one first. For uh, what about with addiction? Um, like, has there been discoveries using this with like helping people with addiction or even if it's not helping more so discovering certain patterns of um, how certain people's brains work and if they work in this way, then they're more susceptible to addiction? Like has stuff like that been discovered? Yes, no, I, I, again, excellent question. Um, so so um, at this point, the application of brain mapping is really, as you say, to discover the underlying mechanics and machinery and the message passing, the architecture, which is what I mean by a functional anatomy or architecture. Um, so if you think about you know, studying the brain like studying the heart, we have to understand how does the heart work? How is it wired? How does it pump? You know, what is its function? We know much less about the mechanics of the brain than we do the heart, but we know a, we know a lot, um, and a lot of a lot of the insights obtained um, about functional anatomy actually derive from people with disorders like schizophrenia, like addiction, um, very much in the same spirit as neuropsychology when people actually have a brain lesion or a cerebral vascular accident, like a stroke. So addiction is particularly interesting um, because it speaks to a failure of motivated behavior uh, or an abnormality of motivated behavior. That, you know, People who are addicted may not um, um, necessarily want to take drugs, but they feel compelled to. So it's a really important um, syndrome um, state of being that tells you a lot about the um, um, or is it, a, uh, it? It tells you a lot about the you know, the um, motivated behaviour, value learning, and how that might be implemented in the brain. If you could actually look at those um, differences in brain responses when comparing people with without addiction, so that whole line of research um, rests upon um, a number of. Um, ways of understanding functional integration. And one important um, player in this is the chemicals that are used to transmit signals from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain. And in this instance, the parts of the brain responsible for deciding what to do and actually executing the plan that you have selected, for mm -hmm. example, say drugs. Um, and those chemicals um, are important to identify and understand because, of course, it is those neurochemical, um, it is the, that form of um, changing the connectivity uh, that is amenable to change with drugs. So, you know, it is interesting, you know, just think about being addicted. You can be addicted to a number of things, but largely it's a, you're, you're addicted to drugs. And it's interestingly, it's usually the drugs that affect these neurochemicals, these neurotransmitters that are responsible for defining what you're going to do next, your selection of the plans or the policies you're going to commit to, uh, what you find valuable, what you find um, um, rewarding. Um, so there's been an enormous amount of work in brain imaging, looking at the, uh, the basis of learning and responding to rewards uh, or motivated behavior. And that has increased our understanding of um, the role of various transmitters that has fed into a corpus of knowledge, which now can be used to think about appropriate treatments for people with uh, addictive behavior. That is okay. So now, now I'm actually understanding a lot more um, meaning of the sense of the brain mapping and like what it is, is it's more about like, like you said, like you have to know how something works to be able to even attempt to fix it. Right. Um, the thing with a addiction I've, I've discovered just through all the interviews I've done and being an entrepreneur myself, and then just knowing a lot of entrepreneurs 
there seems to be some sort of correlation there. Um, and maybe I'm making it up, but just based on the data I have from all the people I've talked to, there's this thing. I'm just curious if you've uh, come across this or what your thoughts are on this, where, so an entrepreneur that a success, I should say successful entrepreneur, it can be very like tunnel visioned and focus on like, say Jeff Bezos, right? Let's just use a, a the most uh, big example or Elon Musk or something. They, in a sense, you would maybe say that they have addictive behavior, but it has been turned into a good, like it's been funneled through a good path. Um, but, uh, and I've heard this, uh, for example, he talks about it publicly, Grant Cardone. I live down in Miami. He's, uh, he's got like billions of real estate, pretty well-known guy. But up till 25, he was addicted to drugs and like all, all these things. And he, he talks about it publicly, which is why I'm uh, okay with sharing that. So I'm just, have you come across or noticed any similarities between like uh, people that have addictive personalities and also though extremely successful people, but it's, it's more of the thing of, like you said, if they can get that part of the brain that connects with the other part to actually take action on what the plan is, those addictive people, if they funnel it towards a good thing, it is like a, it's almost like a power. Like there is power in being an addict as weird as that set sounds. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just curious if you've noticed or if there is in fact a correlation. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. Um, I, I mean, you, 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 I think you've, you articulated that beautifully. As a psychiatrist, I'm making a connection here in terms of what you were saying um, between uh, addictive and obsessional and compulsive behavior. Uh, yeah. And I think that that obsessional and compulsive behavior is not pathological uh, universally. And indeed, you, we all need to be slightly obsessive and compulsive in order to get anything done. Uh, you know, I'm certainly uh, obsessive compulsive in many aspects of, of, you know, of my behavior, and I need to have that to be a rigorous scientist. And I would imagine to be a successful entrepreneur, you certainly need to have that, that rigor and that focus and obsessional attention to what, to, 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 to the global strategy or to the detail. I don't think it matters. The fact that you've got that ability to commit uh, you know, and to um, be um, compelled to pursue things through in the same way that an addict might be compelled to take some addictive drug. But you know, the ability to stick at something, I think, is absolutely, uh, absolutely um, 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 central to success or changing you or your relationship with the world or indeed uh, changing the world. There is also um, a sense that a lot of these very successful people are also uh, you know, slightly on the spectrum as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, there, there are certain overlaps between some um, severe, say, um, Asperger's or autistic uh, um, syndromes and um, the kinds of quality and the focus that you would require to actually persevere and get things done. You know, so, so again, you know, just moving away from addiction per se, and even away from obsessional compulsive disorder, if it is a disorder, um, you know, one can see the same kinds of traits um, in uh, things like you know, autistic, uh, autistic spectrum disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and the like. Uh, and I, I, you know, I sometimes, I'm not sure whether I do joke, but um, um, it may or may not be a joke, but I certainly celebrate my more autistic traits. Uh, you know, try, try to avoid too many people and uh, just getting creating the space to focus on uh, something, you know, single minded, rather, you know, your autistic fashion is the only way you actually, I think, make a difference and get things done. So that's, yeah, it's, I've had multiple people in my life and I have no idea. I've never, but they, they've said that like, Hey, you might be a little bit on, and these are not like qualified individuals. So it's just like a, it's a sentence that's been thrown out, but based on what you just said, I tend to, 
I mean, I love doing interviews, but if I had to choose between like going to a party or like staying in and just hyper focusing on like one thing, I, I mean, I stay in even living in Miami. There's and there's a lot of parties. <laughs> I stay right here <laughs> pretty often. So if that's one of the traits, then that kind of would make sense. But regardless, I have no clue. Um, another question for you would be is if you were to give a percentage um, how much do we understand the brain? Like 1% or like, like how much do you think is like unknown? It, because it's the only thing, right. That it's studying itself, which I think is the reason why, like, you know, studying the heart, well, this is thinking about, so there, even though it's connected, it is different, but this is studying this, which makes it the most complex thing to study. I would imagine. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, and that's a, you know, a very nice observation that the, you know, there's something quite unique about um, about the brain trying to understand itself. And in, you know, you could even invoke a sort of Girdle-esque argument that, that that's an impossible job. That sort of the self-recursion um, speaks to the mathematics of you know there are certain things you just cannot prove or understand or demonstrate um, formally, at least mathematically or logically. Um, and I suspect that a complete understanding of me understanding my own brain is absolutely impossible, simply because <laughs> it is, it is re re recursive. Um, and uh, so you want a percentage. I'm, I'm going to cheat because, you know, the, it, it really depends upon at what level or what scale you want an answer. Um, and perhaps the, um, you know, one way out of answering that question would be to ask, I mean, you, you can't answer this, but it's, you know, um, it, it's what kind of answer would you um, would you want when asked, how does the brain work? Or what is it like to be me? Um, you know, what kind of answer would, would satisfy you? Would it be a mathematical answer? Would it be uh, you know, an info diagram? Um, would it be um, uh, an answer cast in terms of chemistry or would it be uh, an answer cast? Great in point. Yeah, no, 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 because there's so uh, that. Okay, I love, see, that's why I love the podcast. That's cool, man. I get what you're saying. So I, I, the way I was asking, and, and this, I know this, it's, it's impossible probably to answer, but I was, I was thinking like fully encompassing and I'll give a little context. So have you heard of like, um, it's, it's kind of new ish, but, um, for like depression and stuff, uh, ketamine has been, um, being apparently it, it has like huge success rates. It was actually just on like, and whether you find him credible or not pretty well known, it was like on Dr. Oz pretty recently. Um, I have a doctor down here in Miami that does it. And it, like almost all of his clients have had success, but the point of bringing that up is ketamine uh, in the way that he's done it. And I didn't go, I, I just honestly was curious to try it just to be, <laughs> but uh, I didn't go for necessarily a particular reason um, was more like how and hallucinogens. Right. And I've heard like Jordan Peterson talk about this. If you're familiar with him, like these type of things, I feel like just reflect back to us how little we know, you know what I mean? Because the, the ketamine journey was so, I couldn't even describe it to you. I can't even give you a word of it. Like it was nuts. While I was there, I was trying to think like and remember. And then as soon as it was over, I would, like my doctor was like, how was it? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like I was, I was on the moon and now I'm not, you know, <laughs> so like, I don't know. And then like mushrooms or something like, you know, at the whole world mold. So, you know, with that, the question's kind of like, is it, and, and this is where people get into the conversation of, is it actually the drug making that happen or is it indeed unveiling? And that is reality. Now, I don't think reality necessarily is like us, you know, who knows though, I guess, but is it like, is reality more like mushrooms or more like without mushrooms? But then the question is like, well, what's reality? You know, and then you go down that rabbit hole. But so sorry, I'm going all over. But I guess my question is like encompassing all brain things. Would you say we're like even at one percent of understanding what is going on? <laughs> and if you can't answer, I totally respect. I'm no, just that's fine. <laughs> the answer is probably much more um, complete than you uh, might. Oh, really? 
Oh, yeah, it's, it's 42%. Um, yeah. <laughs> no way. Oh, yes. <laughs> Wait, tell me. I think you're messing with me, but you, if I'll, I'll give... No, no, it's, it's 42%. But your... your um, that, those examples are brilliant. Um, you, you know, so certainly ketamine um, you know, ha has a profound role, both therapeutically and diagnostically. So you can actually induce um, very transient psychotic states, which people do experimentally to create, if you like, um, a very transient instantaneous schizophrenia and study brain responses in that particular state. And it goes away very, very quickly. Um, but more interestingly are the hallucinogens you spoke about, the psychedelics, you know, things like uh, psilocybin and magic mushrooms. And there's a lot of interest at the, at the moment in terms of these drugs and their therapeutic potential, both in terms of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy, but also in terms of their neuroplasticity. And the way that they work is exactly, or speaks exactly to, to, to your uh, series of questions about what is reality. And of course, you answered uh, the, 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 the conundrum by um, saying, well, you know, what is reality? Is the reality? Um, and if you if we sort of just backtrack to a, an early part of the conversation where I was talking about the brain making sense of data testing hypotheses as a, a statistical organ, an organ of inference, um, another way of expressing that is to say that it is a fantastic organ in the sense that it is generating fantasies, hypotheses, um, illusions that could be true, and some of them are sufficiently reinforced and evidenced by the data that you sample. So it could be that all our reality is a fantasy. Um, and mm. some people have attributed to so like, like, you know, um, controlled dreaming or controlled hallucination um and i, I you know I, I would subscribe to that completely that you know all of what we perceive of as reality <clears throat> is just the the brain's best guess and best explanation to make sense of all the sensory data and interestingly including the hypothesis or the fantasy that you are you you are a being you are a person. It is possible um, to experience the world without the notion of selfhood. Uh, it's called depersonalization uh, syndrome. And it's also um, the state of mind that you can induce with things like psychedelics. So your, your notion of what's reality uh, versus, you know, is it in a psychedelic state or is it you know, in, in a normal waking state or is it uh, reality during a dream? That's another state of mind you can be in. Of course, all these realities are different kinds of realities, but they're all the brain trying to make sense of its internal machinations and specifically the sensory inputs uh, to which it is uh, you know, exposed and has to go and actively sample. So, you may ask them, well, what's the point in um, dissolving your carefully crafted illusion or fantasy that I'm a person and this is the way that the world works and that's my reality? Well, in some instances, you know, if you've got yourself into a state of mind where that's not working for you, then it may be quite good to, to dissolve that particular reality and allow your mind to explore other realities and other ways of being and other um, models or hypotheses or fantasies about the kind of person I am, indeed, if I am a person. Um, and and that, that sort of notion underwrites or motivates one view of um, assisted psychotherapies, where you actually use these drugs deliberately to dissolve your reality, just so you can explore other hypotheses and, uh, and other options. So if you've had that experience, that's a real gift because not many people actually uh, have the opportunity to see how fragile and how constructed their sense of self and sense of reality is. Um, you know, and imagine what it would be like you know, if your five minutes of ketamine experience didn't go away and you know, became uh, prolonged. <laughs> that would be 
That you know that might you you would it'd be, you you may enjoy it, but from my <laughs> point of view, you, you you'd be probably diagnosed as schizophrenic. You know. It's, yeah, I would need help. I would need immediate help. I'd call you right away. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm coming to London. I need your help right now. <laughs> That's terrifying. But yes, I, with mushrooms, maybe it would be the thing with what you just described there of like, um, and actually, some uh, for some reason, Eckhart Tolle is coming to mind like a lot of self-help authors that talk about being in the present moment and like meditation and stuff, they would, you know, even sober, let's say the word you can get to that state. And I think that's what they kind of mean by being in the present moment that you're um, not noticing any difference between yourself and the world. It's all one connected thing. And I think with mushrooms and um, hallucinogens like that, that to me was my biggest eye opener with that is like, and again, that's like, what is reality type thing. But when you're on those, you do one of the biggest things I realize is you see, you notice how like the universe almost has a rhythm and a heartbeat. Like if you look at a tree, it like looks like it's kind of breathing. Like it's kind of like going like this. So it almost looks like it has its own heartbeat, which when you're not on it, you obviously do not see that or notice that. So it's like, is it there? Or is it not there? It, here's some, and Al, you know, Alan Watts, have you ever heard of Alan Watts? Okay. He's kind of like a spiritual teacher guy. And he says, he's like, the sun is only bright because of like our eyes. Right. So the sun wouldn't be bright if we didn't have eyes. Right. So, cause it's all like in a comparison way. So I wonder like if we didn't have brains would that, so the question would be like, and this is impossible to answer. I'm just thinking that if we didn't have brains, would any of this actually be what it is? Or is it actually a synergistic, like the ocean is there. I'm looking at it in Miami, but without my brain, would it actually be there? You know what I mean? Is that, I don't know. <laughs> like, I think so. But also if no brains were there, would any of this be there because you know it has to be somewhat synergistic right yeah Does that you, make sense? yeah you, you need to be a philosopher you need <laughs> i'm in to dude. Back, back to college i think it's, this this is because of you you're bringing this out of me i'm not normally i mean sometimes but this is fun <laughs> so um but yeah imagine a world without obviously we wouldn't be able to walk around like the brain does so many things but i just mean what well, well actually wait so if you look at the, I mean, a tree doesn't have a brain. So there are living things that are not brain centered or heart centered. No, <sighs> I don't know. It's like the, the, the tree doesn't see the ocean, although it re definitely recognizes water. Yes. But I was just thinking, that <laughs> so. water, but it probably doesn't have a sense of self. So, you know, you and I um, are particular kinds of things that make sense um, um of our world and we can move in that world very rapidly whereas the tree doesn't have that opportunity it still shows a phototropic behavior and can still send its roots out very very slowly but we have to contend um with a world where we are in charge of what we sample so we have to plan how we move our bodies and indeed how we move our autonomic nervous systems to you know do our physiology and um uh, and our homeostasis um and i think you know the, the fact that we have to make sense of data that we are actively in charge of we that leads to this hypothesis i am a person so i don't think a tree would actually need that hypothesis so it's still experience wetness you know through its through its roots and the like um but to come back to your uh, the, the, that was a really, uh, another question which does not have an answer but uh, it, it is a question which those. <laughs> those are the best ones right they are the best ones uh, yeah and, and you really should get a philosopher on and and and, and shout about this from because you know that's uh, as i understand it that's sort of you know um a realist versus a skeptical argument so you know you're either uh, the kind of philosopher who thinks that there's a world out there there's a, a there's a physical reality out there and we are engaged with that we've sampled it we measure it uh, we are part of that we may be synchronized with it 
Um, and then there is uh, another camp um, that is skeptical about the world out there, that everything, everything that we think is reality is actually constructed. It's just a fantasy uh, that only lives in that only lives inside our heads, and uh, uh, including you, I'm afraid. So, from my <laughs> point, of, or, for, or me, from your point of view, um, so it's a really big question. I, I would I would answer it by avoiding the question to a certain extent, but actually, really emphasizing the importance of measurement and inference. Yeah, you know, from a purely physicist point of view. You can ac accommodate, uh, when I say you, I mean you know, the good and great in physics, um, can um, completely describe all of physics as a consequence of measurement, of observation, you know, you, you, things like that. Um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle through to, you know, uh, through to um, gauge theories that rely upon metrics, where metrics are the things that you measure. So if physics, if the, you know, assuming we are realists and there is a physical world out there, there is a, a, an ocean um, over South Beach or, uh, you know, um, then it only becomes into existence when it is measured. Um, so that's a non-philosophical, that would be a physics argument. Um, so, you know, the centrality of this notion of measurement and observation um is highlighted by things like you know Schrodinger's cat and that that thought experiment it's all about measurement observation and inference so i think that that's where the if there is an answer to your question that's where it will lie um it will lie in the importance of the observer and mm. of course we are the observer and we also have this fantasy that we are things and uh, uh, it's me doing the obs observation uh, but you don't need that a tree can observe uh, but the tree has to be up there to do the ob observation yeah i love it <laughs> that's it's i love those um very interesting man well look i want to uh i want to leave it uh, to you and you've kind of motivated me maybe i'll get on somebody who does like uh, i'll do a philosopher and maybe somebody in physics um, that would be interesting. Um, so yeah, I want to leave to you though, like where, where can people find you social media website? Um, and I appreciate you coming on. I really enjoyed the conversation. I, it's so have I. It's, you've asked some very challenging questions. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no answers. Uh, now you, you can't find me on social media. Remember I'm celebrating uh, possibly joking or not being autistic. Uh, so like you, I got to find all the parties and I'm I gonna stay in my house and do my gardening, and do my thing. <laughs> awesome. Okay. No, that's perfect, man. Well, we'll, uh, we'll post about you though on, on our end. Um, but we will not, uh, we will not give how people can contact you though. Cause we know you're going to be at the garden. So that's where you belong. Thank you again for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>